Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the November <laughs> seminar. We're almost at the end of the year. Um, thanks for joining us today. Um, unfortunately, uh, Dr. Joe Spong, who was to present in the second half of the seminar, is is very unwell and and this is a very short notice and i'm sorry uh won't be able to present um but we've got teresa professor teresa icono who is going to present in the first half which might give her a little bit more time if she wishes or more time for discussion or we can just have an early mark um so it's with great pleasure that i introduce Teresa Icono, she's probably one of the longest standing speech pathologists, experts on communication for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities in Australia and probably around the world too, and has an amazing sort of reputation. Everybody knows of the work that Teresa's done. Um, and so she's going to give us what I think is going to be a sort of masterclass today um, about communication. Um, although she's given it a very, a very nice catchy title. So I'll hand over to you, Teresa. Thank you, Chris. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to talk about um, communication. Uh, I often, I don't often get the chance to do this. Um, so the title uh, really, it doesn't come from a, a research project. Well, it does, but uh, it was a project that we did years ago. Um, and even though I didn't quote this in the paper, for I do have a very strong memory of um, working with support workers at a communication camp for adults with intellectual disability. And we were talking to the support workers about the communication of the adults they were supporting. And I remember one of them saying to me, no, he doesn't communicate. I just know what he wants. Um, and it, it sort of seared into my brain, um, sort of the, the um, taking away the power of the person by assuming they knew what the person wanted. So the focus is on the complexity of communication for people with intellectual disabilities. Um, so let me just start with um, what I really want to try and achieve uh, in this presentation, because it, it's a little bit different to what we usually do in a lead seminar, which is present a particular research project. So this is really an accumulation of uh, research experiences of my own and those of some PhD students, uh, my clinical work, my teaching work. Um, so some myths that I'd like to be able to disrupt. So the first one is that there are some people with the intellectual disability who don't communicate. And my response to that is going to be thinking about communication being more than words. The second is that using signs or a picture communication system or AAC, Augmentative and Alternative Communication, makes people lazy. Um, and with this one, I really want to talk about how communication occurs through any means available. Here's a, a, another gem that I've come across many, many times. Perseverative, which is the repetition of the same speech or echolalic speech, which we tend to use in relation to people on the autism spectrum is non-communicative. Um, and to, to kind of get rid of that myth, I really want to talk about communication and conversations as participatory sports, really. People with uh, intellectual disability usually understand more than they uh, uh, communicate or express. Communication actually is multidimensional, so we'll talk about that. And this is one of another one of my favourites, and it's one that I keep um, raising uh, with the LIDS team when we're talking about active support, et cetera, where we talk a lot about choice, um, where asking yes, no questions is thought to be a good strategy when communicating with people with limited speech or communication. Um, and so we're going to talk about conversations being based on interactional rules. So let's start with um, the notion that some people with intellectual disability don't communicate. So communication is more than words. And I'm going to show you one of my absolute favorite pictures. Um, and I have corresponded with the amazing Jane Tracy, Dr. Jane Tracy, about using uh, some pictures she has shared with me over the years. Um, and Jane and her son, Nick, uh, exemplify many of the, um, the issues around really thinking about communication as a very complex process, but 
complex in a rich sense rather than complex being something we tend particularly in speech pathology or augmentative communication to think about in terms of being um, a deficit as in we talk about complex communication needs as though that's something that's peculiar to people who don't rely mainly on speech we all have complex communication needs um, and and so i want to reframe this in terms of communication just being very complex in a very positive and rich sense um, so here yeah, another another of my favorite uh photos of jane and nick uh, where, sorry, I should have mentioned that, um, oops, gone the wrong way. In this, in this picture, there are no words or symbols being exchanged, but there is much communication happening, obviously. Um, whereas here, there are some formal modes of communication being used, but it's still quite uh, meaningful for the interactants. They're sharing information. And here is a great picture of Nick um, with his very many uh, pictured communication systems, which I know Jane has created over many years. And I know Nick uses these communication uh, boards and systems, et cetera, for many purposes, not just as a means to communicate with, with the people around him, to revisit positive experiences or tell people about them, but to also, um, remind himself and to relive those memorable experiences the way many of us do with photo albums and here he is um, with his high tech we don't consider ipads high tech uh, but in the aac world we do and this is a quote from jane i've elevated the status of this quote she just emailed me this the other day with um, some lovely new photos um and she said our recent week at the beach together his ipad is everything to him communication prolo quo to go is an app um, that's used for communication sharing news day one journal independent entertainment youtube and hobby which is photography it's always with him except at the actual beach and and in that quote jane is really encapsulating the fact that um, you know, we rely on different means of communication for different purposes. So I have actually too many windows here to be able to read my own um, my own slides. Um, so really using signs or a pitch communication system uh, has sometimes been touted as making people lazy. I've heard parents talk about it. I've heard therapists say that, I've heard teachers say it, um, and I've heard, um, do I say parents, you know, there's fear that if you give them uh, a mode of communication that is not speech, they'll just stop using speech. Um, and yet, if you have access to speech, it is the easiest way to communicate. Um, and so I've just pulled out a couple of examples, which shows the tenacity around um, trying to communicate a particular message that we sometimes see. So this quote um, is from a study that I did when I was at Scope, uh, where we were looking at the records of the um, uh, non-electronic communication aid service that was being offered at Scope, um, where we interviewed a number of people about the use of the, the low-tech communication that they received, which were things like picture boards and picture shopping lists. So one day, Vincent, uh, the person with disability, attached a real tea bag to the shopping list in lieu of having a picture. So this person wanted to add shopping uh, to the shopping list tea bags, couldn't find the symbol and did the next best thing, went and got a tea bag and stuck it on it. So, you know, he, he found a way to communicate what he was trying to get across. This next quote is from um, Hilary Johnson's PhD work, where she um, had a number of central participants who had complex communication, um, and they're all quite different, but speech was not their main means of communicating. Eric went up to a staff member and finger spelled B to the staff as he was waiting for Betty to come back from a program. The staff member did not recognise the sign, 
So Eric went and took a picture, a photo of Betty from the wall and showed it to the staff. She promptly replied, I don't know, but she'll be back. Oftentimes people who are relying on different ways of communicating have to deal with us, those of us who don't necessarily recognize their methods. And so they're constantly having to find an alternative way uh, to get their message across. Um, I decided to put this one in. This one was sent to me by a parent. Um, I won't go into the reason why she was sharing this with me. It was, it was around a, an NDIS complaint and I was uh, working with her to build a case for um, adding Auslan, an Auslan interpreter to her NDIS plan. Fast enough? For, you want to go even faster? Hey. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> and then no. Oh, stop. Slow. Okay. Slow. Oh, faster. Fast, 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 fast. Oh. Oh. Stop. You want me to count slow? Numbers in Spanish, Spanish numbers. Okay, ready? One, oh, uno, dos, tres, go. Okay. <laughs> so I should mention that Annabelle is not is not deaf. Annabelle has an intellectual disability and is on the autism spectrum, um, and she's. What she's using sign in a way that we often don't see, um, and that is actually combining signs. Um, you know, so we got we get multiple uh, multi word utterances, um, and we we don't often see that. Usually, children with intellectual disability, once they start to combine signs, will kind of take off with their speech. But for whatever reason, Annabelle is not using speech. And I've often said to parents, because they say, why? And my response is, I don't know. And if I did, I'd be famous. Um, we don't know why. It's, you know, there's no um, motoric reason. It just relates to their overall disability. But she's a very active communicator. There's nothing lazy about Annabelle's communication. Okay, now this is... Um, the notion of perseverative speech being non-communicative. Um, and my response is that communication and conversations are participatory. And when people don't have the language skills to um, engage in those social conversational interactions, they will still want to engage. They want to be part of that interaction. So they will use what they have access to. So here's another quote from uh, Hillary's PhD. So if I'm here and she wants attention, it'll be dad, dad, dad. And it really won't stop until you go up there and she'll say, sit, sit, sit. And you sit there for a while. Then she'll say, talk, talk, talk. So you sit down and say, well, what do you want to talk about? And she'll go, talk. And you go, what do you want to talk about? And she'll go, talk. I say, do you want to talk about school? And then she'll say something like, and then I'll say something like, Katie's a good friend. And she'll go, good friend. So, you know, what we see really there is that here's a person who just wants to engage in social interaction, to have a conversation. We see it with young children and we, we don't think twice about it. We, you know, when they're developing communication where um, they will we talk about just babbling or engage in jargon um, because they just really want to be there and be part of the act, if you like, be part of the sport. Um, we see it in children with language delays. I have a nephew who's on the autism spectrum and well before he was able to use words meaningfully, he engaged in conversations through jargon. He used jargon to comment on his play. When I say jargon, we, it was just a stream of sounds with intonation, which we struggled to put any meaning to. And in fact, and I saw myself as fairly skilled at transcribing communication, even if it is just sounds, 
and he challenged me, you know, it was really difficult. Um, and then we saw him starting to break that up and insert some real words um, as he kind of broke the code, if you like. So, um, and, and uh, Jane reminded me in a recent conversation of this where, um, you know, you would often hear people say, oh, he, she just asked the same question over and over and over, and it's driving me nuts. Sometimes it's considered challenging behaviour. Um, and my comment is that sometimes that's all people have access to. They want to break into the conversation, they want to be in the conversation, they want to be in the interaction, but that's all they've got in their repertoire. And they know that speech is the mode, that's what everybody else is doing, so that's what I want to do. Um, and they will use that to participate. And so, in, like in this quote, this support worker kind of got it. Okay, you just want to talk. Let's now talk. So I will say something. And now I'm giving you a bit more to reflect back. So she, um, so she hooked in on friend. So now we've got some turn taking that's happening. And that's what they want. They want to be part of that turn taking. Um, this notion that people with intellectual disability usually understand more than they express. Um, and we're going to talk about communication as a very multimodal um, construct, if you like. And some of this um, has come from work by John Miller in 1981 out of, from the Wasteman Centre in the US, which was a, a centre for mental retardation in those days, research. And um, much of the research in intellectual disability language, and there was a focus on language as opposed to the broader notion of communication, was with uh, people with Down syndrome because it was qualitative, sorry, quantitative research. And those of us who do quantitative research want all our participants to look more like each other than different. And so people with Down syndrome, even though they are actually quite different from each other, look a bit more homogeneous than they do if you put them with a whole lot of other people with different genetic um, problems or unknown causes of intellectual disability. So Miller and his team came up with these three profiles where mental age was equal to comprehension, which is equal to production. That is, they understood and produced language, okay, and the focus was on language, that you would expect given they may have had a mental age of say six months. Now, another profile they found was that mental age and comprehension was pretty well on par, but their expressive language or production was delayed. Okay. Profile number two. Profile number three was mental age was better than comprehension, which in turn was better than production. And when I did speech pathology in the dark ages, um, we were taught that if you had this first profile of mental age being the same as comprehension as production, you, there was no role for you. There was no gap to reduce this person was going was communicating as well as they were ever going to communicate okay um, whereas if you had a gap whether it was between mental age and comprehension and production etc you had something to work on okay um, what what people weren't taking into account and remember this was research that was um, or it was based on a chapter that was published in 1981 was that um, uh, longer lifespans are a recent phenomena for people with intellectual disability, particularly for people with Down syndrome. And so we weren't actually exploring their communication as they got older. Um, and when you think about if you are diagnosed as having a mental age of say six months when you're actually uh, four, uh, the profile that you're going to see is going to be very diff different than if you're, you know, shown to have a mental age of six months or whatever, or really untestable, um, at 40 years, where whatever you've been doing to get by in the world, you've been doing for a lot longer. And so you've developed some strategies in other areas of communication that we weren't really talking about in relation to people with intellectual disability um, not that long ago. So is it a, an oversimplification? 
I think so. Um, and one of the first indicators is that we often have difficulties in understanding or trying to characterize the communication of adults with intellectual disabilities because they won't fit into these nice stages, which I think is a good thing. So a really obvious example um, is what is known as um, cocktail party speech in people with Williams syndrome, where you see that they can, a bit like my nephew, they can engage in, in um, except they're real words, in um, speech and have a wonderful time conversing, but it doesn't make any sense because their comprehension skills are really bad. So now we've got an example of production actually being much better than comprehension, which may even be better than mental age. So where do we go with that? And even in uh, Down syndrome language, one of the things um, that we've realised is that um, when you unpack comprehension, people with Down syndrome have relatively strong understanding of single word vocabulary but their comprehension, so they know, they understand lots of words. So if you do a test, and for those of you who've got speech pathology backgrounds who are in the audience, if you do a test like the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, which is well known, um, and it's quite useful because it spans an age in terms of who you can administer it to for about 18 months to, I don't know, I think it's 90 something, anyway, something ridiculous. Um, and it will give an age, uh, a mental age equivalent. So, you know, when you're doing research and they want to know the mental age, it's better than nothing. It's better than doing a full IQ test. You can argue about whether that's appropriate, but, um, but, but if you use that as a way of thinking, of trying to say, well, then they must understand um, what, say they come out with a mental age of seven. Well, a seven year old has a very sophisticated understanding of uh, syntax and you know sentences etc but people with down syndrome actually don't they're quite poor in terms of understanding um, whole sentences however what we were looking at was the fact that if you really looked at them in those social contexts and now start doing some more qualitative research heaven forbid you'll actually find that they have strengths in social interactions and so it's kind of a double-edged sword because what tends to happen is in the real world they'll say oh he understands everything because you know i see that he can interact and he responds but you know he won't do what i've asked him so he's just being a little you know or he's got challenging behaviors and but when you break it down you say actually what he is responding to or she is single words in what you're saying because they're quite good at those single words but they don't actually understand the whole sentence so if you say um you know get your bag and line up we're going to go outside they might hear bag and outside and they're off okay but if you can say no actually they've act they've missed the rest of it so they're not being little so-and-sos they're actually responding according to their you know to to the words that they've heard so sometimes that sort of understanding where you can reframe or um, whether it's teachers or support workers, what's going on for the person can actually be quite useful because we now start to realise um, something about the complexity of their communication. Um, now this, the triple C um, checklist is uh, a tool that was developed by um, colleagues at SCOPE and it's been uh, used for quite a number of years. In fact, it's probably one of the few useful tools for trying to get a sense of the communication skills of adults um, with more severe intellectual disability who are not typically relying on speech. Um, and I, I had the opportunity to work with um, Karen Bloomberg and Denise West and Hilary Johnson to, um, really try and understand what the tool was actually testing because as I mentioned communication is so multimodal and we need to think about um, you know what are the indicators to tell us somewhere about where this person is functioning and, and then think about well why are we doing this and the reason the triple c 
um, or, or the, the best use of the triple C is to get, um, because it, it tends to be used with people in um, supported accommodation or attending day services, where you're really wanting to get, um, say, the support worker to become observant in terms of what the person is doing and get a sense of what, what aspects of communication are they demonstrating? What are they understanding? Um, you know, how can you become sensitive to their signals, for, for want of a better word? Um, and one of the things that uh, we realised is that uh, the original version of the triple C, this is a revised version, we were talking about pre-intentional, for example. Um, now, pre-intentional means that, you, you know, when you think about an infant, an infant is not intending to communicate. People find really hard to get their heads around. Like, they get very annoyed with me when I say that. But really, before, at least before nine, eight or nine months, their intention is not to share a piece of information with you. Their intention is to get a need met. Like, if they're hungry, they want food. Or if they want... Um, comfort, they, you know, they will do something and we will respond to that. Um, and we will interpret what they're doing as though they were communicating with us. So, you know, a child who, um, who pulls away from the, the bottle, um, you know, will say, oh, you're, you're full. <laughs> as though the child had said, no more, thanks, mum, I've had enough. Um, you know, so we interpret or, you know, when the child, uh, you know, get, frowns at us, you know, there's a beautiful dance that happens between a parent and a child where the child, you know, will, or the infant, will um, show something on their face and the parent or caregiver will respond as though that infant has communicated something um, intentionally with them, okay? And, and the uh, theory is that what we do is we draw them into um, that social interaction and by putting, you know, if we take a behavioural approach, there are different ways of looking at, at this, we are actually rewarding those behaviours and we are shaping them to become much more conventional, okay? So then, you know, over time, you know, the, a child who wants something will start reaching and then pointing, etc. So anyway, when you apply that model to adults, it just didn't seem to work because of the reasons that I mentioned earlier. And that is that um, if you've been at a stage for a long time, a lot of other things are happening. So, and, and it's hard to know if it's pre-intentional or pre-symbolic. I'll talk about that in a moment, because we don't know if they're going to progress to the next step. Because the one question you always have with someone with a severe disability is, Am I seeing underlying competence? So is there a skill under there? Like, are they actually symbolic and I'm not giving them the opportunity to demonstrate that? Or are they truly not symbolic? That is, they don't have an internal representation of a symbol. Like they don't know that um, when there isn't a cup in front of them, that there is such an entity as a cup, which has a label, whether it's a pictured label or a spoken label, okay? Or is it that because of the nature of their disabilities, they're not able to demonstrate it or because of an unresponsive environment, we're not picking up the cues. So you're never quite sure. So that's the first thing that you've got to address. But, but in trying to characterize the communication of people, you know, triple C can be quite useful, particularly when it's used to uh, talk to or sit down with a support worker and say, okay, let's talk about the signals that this person is giving out, the things that they're responding to, so that you've got an understanding of where they're at and how you can allow them into the interaction or support their interactions or support their further, or make sure you're not hindering their ability to participate. So we did a, a couple of studies um, where we were looking at um, you know, underlying issues of validity and, I want, and also reliability between support workers. Um, and what we found was that um, support workers, like if you had two support workers filling out the same form for the one individual, they actually had pretty good agreement. This was after training on how to use it. They had pretty good agreement that they were seeing the same things. 
but they were really bad at interpreting it in terms of putting it into stages. And really, they shouldn't have to. That's the job of the speech pathologist or you know, whoever. Um, so, you know, someone who's unintentional passive um, is really not trying to communicate, but is responding to what's going on around them, reacting to stimuli, maybe aware of um, people and objects, but is not um, trying to interact with them. Um, and, and they're pretty well focused on the here and now. Whereas unintentional active, maybe that they're actually intentionally trying to act on things, on the objects, but not necessarily for the purpose of communicating with another person, okay? And then you move up to intentional informal, which means that uh, they use facial expression or reaching or behaviours that actually where they are trying to communicate a message to you and we need to be uh, sensitive to those and respond to them. And then you move into um, symbolic, which means I can use a spoken word or a sign or a picture and know that it represents this object or activity or, or whatever. Um, and many people with, particularly with severe intellectual disability, may have some really good symbolic skills, but often times don't move up to um, that next level, which we call symbolic established, and really should um, provide the, the leg up, if you like, that will allow people to move into really extended language. Um, and we, we, for people with severe disabilities, we don't often see that, okay? So let's think about the various, I kind of skirted around this, now I want to attack it. Um, this Bloom and Leahy, this is the model they proposed in terms of what communication is all about. So they won't just think about words. Um, it's a very old model. It's, it's been very useful. It continues to be useful. Uh, and it's useful because it um, is comprehensive and it's easy to explain and it allows us to think about what we're trying to do when we're supporting someone's communication. So it's basically, you know, the form is what most of us focus on. Speech, sentences, um, signs, the written form, whatever, okay? Um, the content is what's the meaning behind those words, okay? Um, so, you know, we, we sometimes, um, you know, we've all had experience where people have, um, you know, what we call content-free conversations where they just want to seem to just want to talk for the sake of it, you know. Um, but, you know, content or form should actually reflect the intended content that the person is trying to uh, convey. And then there's the use. That is why are we using these forms. So to give you an example, if I say to you, the apple is red, okay, the content is, it's about an entity, an, an apple, and it's about an, a, a descriptor of the apple. It's a red apple. So that's, that's the underlying content. The form that I've used is a sentence with a number of individual words that are strung together according to English word order, which means I'm using language. So when we talk about language, we're really talking about that ability to combine and recombine individual words into novel utterances. Now, the use may not be quite so apparent when, you know, in this sort of example. I could just be saying to you that I'm sharing this information and I just want to share it. I just want to tell you about this apple is red. This apple is red. Or I could say, this apple is red. Kind of connotations of even the garden of, um, of paradise, etc. you know. Um, or it could be, this apple is red, as in, you think this is red? I'll tell you what red is, you know. Um, so we have different reasons for using the same forms and it's often intonation and the context and whatever else goes on with our communication that really conveys that. So when all this comes together, our communication tends to be effective and efficient. We get our message across 
um, you know, most all communication interactions have a, have a you know some failures, and we do our some work around repairing. Like, what did you mean by that? Or sorry, I didn't hear that last word. So we we have these strategies, and and that's the use of our language too. You know, if I ask you a question, it may be no, no, I'm not disagreeing with you. I just didn't get the last bit that you said. Okay, so we're seeking clarification. But with people with um, you know, communication disabilities, sometimes these areas start to kind of move apart. Okay? They don't function as efficiently for whatever reason, whether it's a quiet brain injury or a developmental disability or, or whatever. But for whatever reason, you know, a particular part of the brain and a quiet brain injury has been affected, which could affect one or more of these areas. But in developmental disabilities, it's not quite so um, distinct. So, and this is just an example. You can have um, someone whose forms are somewhat limited. They might have some signs and they might use some word approximations, but they don't have the full repertoire that are available to most people. Their content may be limited in that, which, um, and that could be because of an intellectual disability, which means that they um, are not learning as much or as quickly as their peers, um, or, you know, again, with children, we kind of say, as a child, um, you know, develops and is experiencing more than the things that they have to, uh, you know, the content about which they can communicate expands. So that's about your world knowledge um, and, you know, the underlying meaning or that meanings that are available to you, okay? But their use is often, and this is what we see over time, their uses may continue to grow, okay? So with my nephew, you know, he had very little limited forms early on. He was young, so there's only so much content you can communicate. Um, but his uses, like he could protest and he could try and initiate conversations and take his turn in conversations. He could share information with you. So his uses for communication were quite vast comparing to, compared to the other areas. And we see this with people with intellectual disability, okay? They may have limited limitations in their content and in their form, but because communication and our reasons for having language are, are, are socially constructed and has social reasons, then often the use grows, okay? But what they are more reliant on, because form in particular um, may be limited, is and, and that means that they don't have the conventional means of communicating. They're really dependent on us as observers to do exactly that, to observe and then respond. And unfortunately, um, what sometimes happens is that we don't observe and respond, we try to control. So when it doesn't all come together, social interactions still remain core. That's the whole purpose of communicating. Uh, I love this, um, these quotes from, you know, um, uh, from people who've been studying language development and, you know, um, uh, and really trying to understand what's going on. So John Locke uh, said, it will take the child a year to start talking but on every day of that year, a variety of language related mechanisms. So that's biological, neurological mechanisms that are happening as the child infant develops, will inch their way toward efficient action. And John Locke talks about the fact that as far as an infant is concerned, speech is what other people are doing. And that's what that child wants to be a part of. And any of the, of us who watch infants and you know, get engaged with infants, will remember those experiences of talking to an infant and they will look at you in the eyes, but they'll be fingering your mouth. It's like, I want to do what you're doing. You know, I mean, I don't know if that's what they're thinking, but because I'm interpreting unintentional behaviour, but that's the sense that you get. And Len Vygotsky said, social relations or relations among people 
sorry about that. Social relations are relations amongst people genetically underlie all higher functions and their relationships. And so what they're saying is that we are geared up as human beings to engage in those social interactions, as is shown with Nick. And I quite, uh, many of these uh, photos I like because um, it's the social interactions that are core. The fact that Nick is signing, I don't know if that's signing for lunch or, you know, I'm not sure because I'd like to, you know, you have to see the whole thing, but it's that enjoyment of those social interactions and being part of them. And um, Hilary Johnson, again, her PhD, has wonderful examples of, the, of you know, being part of the social action, if you like, uh, regardless of how much form or the forms that the person had access to or the content that they had to reflect in their form. Um, and she wrote a paper on having fun and hanging out and how people did that when they didn't have full conversational skills. Um, the other day he was sitting in the chair and he looked at me and laughed, bam, way, mama. And I went, yam, bad, yammer. And we did that for four minutes, both laughing. He knew it was nonsense. So what's, you know, what's the function of that? Having fun, being together, sharing an experience that only someone who knows you can actually share. All right. Now. This one I put in because um, in LIDS, we've been working uh, on active support, as you know, and there was a video in an active support um, where someone with obvious profound intellectual disability and physical impairment was being shown two options of things, it was around choice, and the person was saying, well, do you want to play on the computer? Yes or no? And they had a yes, no, I think it was, I think they were written words on his, um, on his tray. And I immediately put my head, you know, bang my head on the table. I went, oh no, please save me. <laughs> so I had to put this one in. And we look, speech pathologists in who work in AIC, you know, they often will start with yes, no, you know, teach them a reliable yes, no. And my question is always, whose purpose does that serve? Does it serve the individual or is it about us really needing them to comply with what we want them to comply with. And I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Um, the conversations are based on interactional rules. Grice, um, no, I can't remember what uh, disciplinary background Grice came from, probably um, sociology or social linguistics. Um, he talked about the underlying rules, if you like, for conversations. The maxim of quantity Be as, as informative as you can, giving enough but not too much information. Now, that doesn't mean to say we all do that, but we notice when it doesn't happen. We talk about that people being verbose and you want to say, just get to the point. You know, you don't, you, you know, you don't need all this extra. There's the maxim of quality. Be truthful. Don't give false information or information not supported by evidence. The fact that there is such rule means that people, when people lie, we um, feel as though some, um, uh, some agreement has been violated. And if those things didn't happen and we didn't recognize them, we would have no need for an ICAC or a IBAC or whatever. So, you know, people lie, but it's a violation of that maxim. There's the maxim of relation, be relevant, say things that are pertinent to the discussion. You know, and again, if people are not being pertinent or relevant, then we will say things like, are you, you know, you've gone off on a tangent. What's that got to do with X? And then of manner, try to be as clear, as brief and as orderly as you can and avoid obscurity and ambiguity. Okay. So this is not so much about making sure people with intellectual disability do this, but it's more about what are we doing when we engage with people who've got communication disorders or impairment or intellectual disability? Are we violating some of these? So um, one of the things that you, um, uh, so my first question is, is there a belief that people with intellectual disability who engage in conversation break 
these maxims or maxims on general rule of conduct. Um, do people with intellectual disability say yes to yes, no questions? That is, do they acquiesce to please the questioner? And for a long time, we believe that. Or are they just responding by any means that are available to them? Um, and the work of Rapley, and Rapley is from, uh, from Queensland, uh, Finlay and Antarki and colleagues have, uh, has brought into, questions, into question this belief. And, and this notion of acquiescence came from the work of Sigelman and colleagues in the 1980s. So um, Rapley, Finlay and Antarki have, have engaged in a series of studies in which conversational analysis has been applied to conversational samples, such as between researchers or support workers and adults with intellectual disability. Um, so in a 1996 study, Rapley and Antarki explored acquiescence in adults with intellectual disability who were participating in a quality of life questionnaire. And the data that they worked with were from eight interview transcripts. They did a detailed transcription and then they applied conversational analysis, which is a qualitative approach. And I, and I must admit, conversational analysis was the first form of qualitative analysis that I ever could get my head around. It made sense to me because you were looking for patterns in a, uh, a string of behaviours, if you like. So a key principle in conversational uh, analysis is that people in an interaction achieve their meaning by actively using each other's expectations about what comes after what in the normal sequence of talk. So uh, conversational analysis uh, required very, requires very detailed transcription where you transcribe not just the words, but the intonations and the pauses and the pitch changes um, in such a way that I'm going to read this out, but I'm not going to be able to capture all those um, what we call paralinguistic aspects, um, but, you know, can give you a sense of what's happening. So um, this, these are just a couple of findings from the study. So they talked about pseudo acquiescence. Um, so the interviewer says, and it's part of their uh, quality of life survey, do you feel out of place? Out and about in social uh, situations and before? Like um, he actually gets to the end um, and says, no. And, and he kind of overlaps and says, and eh? never, no. Interviewer says, sometimes. She keeps saying, no. Then he says, or usually. So then she says, mm, sometimes I do. Okay, we'll put a two down, which is two for uh, sometimes for that one then. Okay. So the initial no, very firm no, has been changed because for some reason it just wasn't acceptable. Then there's pressure to change answers. The interview says, yeah, wait three seconds. Uh, are there people living with you who, who, who bother you sometimes or hurt you? And Bob says, no make you, not accept, make you angry or pester you? Bob says, no, no. So yeah, almost saying yes. Yeah, like the people you live with. Bob says, yes, yeah. So he's reformulated this in a way where he's gotten the yes, but it's actually like, I'm just confirming that the people I live with are not bothering me. And more recent, slightly more recently, recent study, Finlay and Antarki looked at ways in which disability support staff transform questions in order to solicit an adequate reply in order to fulfill the interactional goal of the question. So they've got an intent in mind, okay? They, they're gonna get the answers to these questions. Um, data from videos for an epigraphic study, so about 30 hours. Now, given the, um, the detailed transcription, this is quite a heavy duty study. Um, questions were used, and they found questions were used by staff for clarification of communicating, communication, trying to determine the meaning of a behaviour, to assess a person's choice or preferences, uh, and in initiational pursuit of a physical activity, that is to look at the person's readiness to begin or willingness to continue or end an activity, giving advice or making suggestions like a better way of doing something or encouraging reflection or social participation. 
Um, and they looked at failed questions in particular. So these were questions where the response, um, there either was no, well, there was no response, or uh, the question didn't get them either, or the answer was unrelated to the topic, or the questioner felt the answer was inadequate. So here's an example. Um, Jill, Damien, what would you like to do now? Would you like to go to the toilet? Damien looks at her with a smile, appears to make no response. Jill laughs. Damien, would you like to go to the toilet? Well, people like to go to the toilet. Damien mm, turns his head away. Jill, huh? Yes or no? Sound like an interviewer of a politician. Yes or no? Damien sways head, mm, turns head away. Tell me, coffee's all gone. Coming to the toilet. So now she's modifying her language. Yes. Damien looks at her, then sways head, looking to the left and right. And Jill says, yes. Looks away, smiles, lets the, his head fall, fall, looking at the table. Mm. Looking away, then up, then, then away, then up, then away, grinning, obviously enjoying the interaction. Okay. Jill, shall we go to the toilet, Damien? And about 25 seconds later, which is actually quite a long period, offers an alternative to the toilet. Shall we go to the toilet or do you want to go and watch the television? Okay, so besides the obvious, the thing that struck me about that was here you've got someone who actually probably is not understanding the language, the sentences. And so what we do, and we all do this, this is not saying support workers are particularly bad. This is what we do. We just keep adding words and we make the linguistic task that much harder. Okay. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna sort of end soon, don't worry, Chris. Um, but, but this is what I say to people. Okay, children, developmentally, Children understand when, in terms of word order, a basic sentence structure. You want an apple. Subject, you want verb, apple, object. When you turn that into a sentence, do you want an apple? You shift around the subject. So you make, you, you carve up the verb, you put the do at the beginning, then you've got the subject, then you've got the other bit of the verb, and then you've got the object. And typical, follow-up questions to that sort of question is, what do you want? Do you want an apple or do you want a banana? You like apples, don't you? <laughs> and, and this is what we do. So understanding how best to enhance social interaction, communication and or language in people with intellectual disabilities who may do it differently comes from very detailed and prolonged engagement with them in social contexts. Um, so, you know, really what I'm posing, and I'm not going to try and answer it all, is what does it mean to like intentional communication according to criteria that we all have that actually goes beyond a person's sensory, physical or intellectual capacity? So, for example, you know, with a young child, we kind of go, OK, we know that it's intentional if they look between you and the object and look back and then add a signal. And, you know, we ask for very complex behaviours to demonstrate to us an underlying capacity. What does it mean to have some symbolic language but not sufficient to sustain actual linguistic development sentences? What are the long term implications of problems in one or more of the areas of form, content, or use? And how do we respond to interaction with people with profound intellectual disability so that we ensure social connection and avoid risk of ignoring that person altogether or thinking we know what they want? And, you know, I'm not going to go through this, but really that notion of what impacts on all those areas is broadening the more we know. You know, it, physical health, the physical and social environment, mental health of the person, all of these can impact on the ability to engage in effective and efficient communication. Um, sorry, I've already talked about, um, and we, we've given this, sorry, this is about um, just reminding us that really people will communicate using whatever means they have available to them, okay? As we saw in this example of Eric's finger spelling and the example of having fun and hanging out. The, the issue is though, people in the environment may 
environment may not notice or view unconventional behaviors as being communicative. And that can result in the person just not doing it anymore, like giving up. And as a, you know, as a new speech pathologist working with people with significant disabilities, I found those individuals who are at the back of the classroom where the teachers had given up on them were the hardest to engage because the environment had stopped responding to them. So they were harder than people with challenging behaviours because they were still trying to affect a change or a response from their environment. So it was easier to replace those. Well, that did it by itself. I didn't mean to do that. It was easier to um, address those behaviours because you could provide an alternate behaviour in the form of a sign or a symbol. Um, and when symbols are not in the medium, for people who, who have profound disability, the work of Sheridan Foster is, um, is really, Foster is really uh, inst instructive here and has enormous um, implications. So Sheridan looked at effect attunement in, in communicative interactions between adults with profound intellectual disabilities and their support workers. And it's the immediate recasting of the emotional behavioural state of one person by another, where those behaviours are emphasised as an example of combining effort and attention. This is from um, a paper by Sheridan. Uh, the participant was gazing at the support worker, drops head to the right, then raises it. And the disability worker raises her eyebrows, then nods down. So she was reflecting those behaviours and almost acknowledge them and engaging in those, well, it was acknowledged them, and engaging in that dance that I talked about earlier on that you see as a natural thing between a parent and an infant or adult and an infant. So here are the takeaways. Focus on the social inter interaction. It's not just what you say. We always talk about directing the communication to the person. And I say to people, use sentences. We don't know what they understand, but they'll understand that you're engaging it with them in an interaction. Minimise questions. Like don't add layers and layers of questions. Use complete sentences, reducing to simple phrases or single words when options are being given or to direct understanding. So instead of saying, you know, do you want to play on the computer or do you want to use the computer? You can just say, computer? and point to it and see if they have any sort of response that says, yeah, actually, I think that'd be a great idea. Use and make available all, mo all modalities, like gestures and signs, etc. But most importantly, I think we have to kind of hang back, give, give the person an opportunity to in initiate, give them a chance to do something that we can observe and then respond to. So it's around watching, listening, waiting and responding. And what we all need to do in interacting with people with quite significant communication impairments is learn to be comfortable with long pauses, with silence, and, and give the person the space to fill that silence or, or to, to give us the opportunity to notice those subtle behaviours. And just to end with some great multimodal pics and so, all um, centering around social interactions, Here's more photos from Jane and Nick. Thanks to Jane and Nick, or Nick and Jane. All righty.